No. We no. can still. This is we are online. Quick watch on. Okay, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I uh, propose we get uh, started. Well, good afternoon to most of you. Um, uh, good day for those who are joining us from uh, another time zone. Um, I'm very happy to see many of you uh, online. And we have actually gathered, as you can see, uh, with some of the speakers at uh, the Office of the European Trade Union Institute, ETY, in Brussels. It seems to some extent uh, strangely exciting uh, to, be, uh, to be in a room together again at an actual table. Uh, many of you or some of you will remember our last live conference with OSE and ETY uh, jointly organized on the 12th of March, 2020. Indeed, the day before Europe went uh, into lockdown. And uh, so much has happened uh, since then, of course. I don't think I have to remind you. And especially in the past um, few weeks. Um, and maybe I'll just uh, take the cover of um, the Bilan book uh, that we are discussing today, or at least some of the chapters of them. Um, we wrote on the cover just a few weeks ago, the European Union is currently fighting on two main fronts, COVID-19 and climate change, though with skirmishes elsewhere, including migration and the rule of law. And of course, we could never have imagined for even one second uh, when we wrote these words uh, only a few weeks ago um, that by now an actual war would be fought uh, on the European continent. The biggest refugee uh, crisis since the Second World War is now unfolding. More than 2.5 million Ukrainians have fled their country since Russia's um, invasion. But we're here today, of course, to discuss the green and uh, digital uh, transitions, uh, which are two of the uh, chapters of the book that we've just produced with ETY on social policy in the European Union. Um, and the question that we would like to mostly table today is what uh, the EU can do to deliver uh, its promises in those two, uh, with regard to those two uh, transitions or twin transitions that we call them. We gathered, I think, a very nice uh, panel of speakers uh, today, both in the room uh, and online. Um, we'll start in a moment with uh, two uh, of the authors of the chapters that have been uh, written in this year's book. First of all, on, on my left, on your right, I guess, uh, Hans Brönings. Welcome, Hans. Good to see you again after all these years as well. Uh, Hans is, of course, uh, director at the European Environment uh, Agency, uh, and he and his colleagues from uh, the agency wrote a chapter on the Green Deal. And then secondly, Aida Pons de Castillo. Uh, Aida is a um, senior researcher uh, in this house at the European Trade Union Institute. And she, of course, wrote a very nice chapter on uh, Europe's digital um, agenda. Um, after these two interventions, uh, we can take, if, uh, if this is appropriate, a few uh, questions uh, from the audience. There is a chat, uh, sorry, there is a Q&A function uh, in Zoom. Please uh, use the Q&A. We'll uh, follow it, uh, follow it uh, from here. Uh, and then after these uh, few initial questions, uh, then um, Felix Mayeux, uh, Kathleen Muller, and Sebastiano uh, Sabato, whom I will introduce uh, properly afterwards, I will introduce the Q&A with the audience. And we have ample time for discussion. That's why we didn't pack uh, the agenda with many speakers. Um, so please uh, prepare your questions whenever you want. Um, just to remind you very quickly, because I took a copy of the book, that's the English version since today. There is also the French version. It looks the same, but this one is called Bilan Social de l'Union Européenne. Uh, you can also download the free copy of the book from the uh, ETY 
uh, website is bilingual and so please um, download it or order it as you uh, as you see fit. Uh, by the end of the seminar, Slavina Spasova, senior researcher um, at the OSE and myself will present the conclusions of the book and of today's uh, event. Um, and that's all I want to say. Nicola, we are, uh, we finally get to meet each other after uh, two years almost of collaboration since you started working at DTI. All these Zoom meetings, all these online meetings, we finally get to meet each other um, in the context of the dissemination of the 22nd edition of Social Policy in the European Universities. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Bart. Thank you very much, colleague, uh, colleagues. It's, it's a real pleasure uh, to be here in person. It's a real pleasure to see that a lot of people can benefit uh, uh, and make the most of uh, the technological opportunities that we have uh, discovered uh, during uh, partly uh, thanks to the pandemic. Uh, and I think this is really uh, an interesting uh, example of uh, uh, part of the conversation that we will be having uh, today. There are at the moment, uh, in Belgium at least, there are uh, any significant restrictions on meeting together. In fact, we are meeting for work uh, at last, uh, but uh, it's clear that uh, one of the legacies uh, of the pandemic, and there are several negative legacies, of course, but one of the positive ones is that we have rediscovered the importance uh, and uh, the, the, the purpose of uh, uh, certain digital tools that were indeed uh, available uh, but uh, we weren't making the most use of it. And the proof is that we have uh, approximately 100 people uh, joining us uh, uh, online. And I think this is likely to uh, continue in, uh, in, in the future, regardless of uh, whether we have uh, new multiple waves, uh, yes or no. And imagine if uh, these uh, 100 uh, people had actually decided to join us today, they would have. Uh, uh, presumably uh, taking uh, some form of uh, transport company that uh, they would have uh, perhaps flown from abroad. Um, you can uh, immediately understand what the implications are, but of course a lot of people are also joining us uh, remotely for work reasons, uh, not just because of the extremely interesting conversation that we're having today. And of course, uh, remote work, which is also another a feature uh, of uh, the world of work as we've known since the pandemic is likely to continue. And that will have a number of other important implications for the purposes of uh, the digital agenda, the digitalization of work. And uh, <clears throat> you can see how uh, this 22nd edition of uh, the Dilan uh, retains uh, its uh, actuality and importance and is likely to do so for a uh, uh, significant uh, part of uh, our future, in spite, of course, of uh, the recent developments that uh, Bart was referring to, the very tragic developments stemming from the Russian invasion in uh, uh, the Ukraine. And, uh, but even that, we can see uh, it's happening before our eyes. It's having an impact in some of the conversations that we'll be having today. Uh, of course, uh, we realize the importance of uh, ridding ourselves from the dependence from carbon fuel, which is often sourced from uh, countries with a dubious democratic uh, record and come to generate instability in the world uh, because of that record. Uh, but of course, uh, in the short uh, term, resilience and strategic autonomy are becoming priority and we're also talking about uh, just accelerating the decarbonification but in the short term reopening coal mines and uh, uh, making the most of whatever resource is available to us in the next winter I can see us uh, burning a part of the furniture the way things are going um, so um, the influx of migrants uh, clearly uh, it's a different uh, migratory way that we're having at the moment we're seeing a lot of young, educated, many women with children. And imagine uh, the challenges that that brings into a labor market that, uh, let's be honest, is not doing particularly well at integrating women uh, uh, on a daily basis. I uh, uh, can't imagine doing particularly well with this new influx. But then again, 
maybe that digital tools, digital work, remote work, offer new opportunities that have been given to and explored. And perhaps we need to think about uh, that form of integration in the labor market now that we have the means. This is uh, perhaps a slightly longer introduction to provide uh, uh, some context about how present, uh, actual, and real some of the intuitions developed, uh, in particular by the two. Uh, speakers who are also authors of two chapters that speak exactly to these topics uh, are here uh, today and uh, very much looking forward just to their uh, uh, presentations but also to the conversation and the debate I'm sure will ensue from that with the other speakers and of course with uh, our participants and thank you very much uh, Bart uh, thank you very much uh, Slavina colleagues thank you for uh, uh, making uh, uh, this wonderful issue of uh, the Bilan. Looking forward to our discussion. Thank you. Okay, and thank you so much, Nicola, for your very uh, positive feedback and for immediately setting the scene uh, for today's uh, debate. Just before I pass the floor, uh, as my father already said, it there is uh, interpretation available, um, French and English. Uh, so, by all means, uh, please use this uh, facility if you um, so wish. Now, without any further ado, I'd like to uh, pass the floor and also indeed the computer. Thank you, Aida, uh, for taking the initiative to um, Hans, uh, Hans Bernings, who is indeed uh, director. Uh, I'll also give you uh, the mouse, um, who is director at the European Environment Agency, uh, who is very much into digital skills and will therefore very easily manage uh, to uh, pop up his PowerPoint presentation. Please, Hans, the floor is yours for the next 15 minutes. Okay, thank you, uh, Bart, uh, and also Slavina and, and Nicola for the opportunity to, uh, to engage with all of you in the discussion on the link between the European Green Deal and the social dimension of uh, European policies, which I think is absolutely critical. And I want to emphasize that at the European Environment Agency, we are, uh, I think, increasingly framing the work that we do in that social dimension. Um, environment and climate policies uh, have to be embedded in the social reality in which they have a specific function and goal and a set of targets because they are intimately connected to it. So I would like to uh, speak to that dimension a bit uh, stronger. Um, well, you... Uh, I'm trying to go to the next slide, which I'm yeah. click on the mouse. I am clicking on the mouse. Well, and some assistance. No. Well, I I can. Uh... Okay. All right. Okay. Good. Well, let, let me first uh, introduce very briefly again the, the goals of the European Green Deal and why there is a European Green Deal. I think that the key <laughs> reasoning is that we are facing a number of crises of the system Earth, you could say. It's a climate crisis, a loss of biodiversity. There are really serious issues with resources and the impact they have uh, our resource use in our economy on climate and biodiversity, and of course, the link with human health, which is increasingly well understood as a critical dimension. Um, therefore, we needed a strong response, and that is the European Green Deal. And to put it a bit bluntly, maybe, but the previous commission in its uh, core plan uh, under uh, Mr. Juncker uh, mentioned environment uh, once in a sentence that talked about business environment. Yeah? Uh, the, the, the shift to this uh, commission could not be uh, larger. So we want to be the first climate neutral continent, minus 55 by 2030, climate neutrality by mid-century. We've got a biodiversity strategy that, that is really uh, setting new standards, new circular economy action plan on resource efficiency and use, zero pollution, which is a really strongly stated uh, set of ambitions that have a strong link with human health as well farm to fork which is the first time that the european uh, union frames a strategy that is about the food system and not just on agriculture and then maybe surprising when 
the commission launched the proposal, the just transition element. And I think that is absolutely uh, critical because we, we are for the first time linking uh, a set of very ambitious green policies to an explicit goal of doing this in a just way. Mm -hmm. So, and of course, for that, we will need to go to the core of our economy, which is investments and the role of capital. That's a sustainable investment plan. And it needs to be linked to a new industrial uh, strategy because Europe wants to be in the lead on the, this type of economy. Now, many people understand this agenda still as an, an environment and climate agenda. I, I like to frame it as an agenda that is about fundamental systemic social change, which for me means that it is the political, economic and investment priority for Europe as much as an environment and climate priority. It has a strong systemic transitions logic, and I think that is critical also in the link to social policy, a strong link with sectoral policies where we've had three generations now. One, the first generation is pollute less. Yeah? The second generation was mostly about being more efficient. And now the third generation and the challenge for economic sectors is could you please reinvent yourself? Because we will need you to deliver to society within planetary boundaries. It's a complete reinvention of what is there. The interconnected nature is important, longer time horizons, very few policies have a 2030 and even 2050 time horizon, that, that really is important. And I think social policy can be really critical in making that explicit because I think there is more information on long-term social change than there was necessarily in some of the other uh, dimensions and then innovation digitalization. So it, it is really uh, important and it should land in a governance agenda. If we don't manage to come up with a governance system that can merge these ambitions, it will not work. Yeah. Now, I think it's fair to say that that social dimension, just transition, is probably underdefined. Yeah. It's, it's often a one sentence slogan now, if I can push it a bit, uh, leaving no one behind. But what does that really mean? Yeah, it's underspecified. Uh, what, what is it exactly we are talking about? It's fair to say that there is a rather poor knowledge base on it because we have uh, in the past established a really good knowledge base on social issues in Europe. Huh? and also on climate and environmental issues, but those were two separate worlds, two separate knowledge domains, two sets of institutions. They didn't really speak to each other and they now need to do that. With the European Environment Agency, we are trying to do that. We're working with the European Foundation in Dublin. We're working with other actors, including uh, in this case, uh, the, the Observatoire Social and the, the Educate to We partners. European Economic and Social Committee. So I think that is important yeah, that, that we, we do that. Um, the need to do that, I think is clearer now than at any time in the past uh, 10 years. And we had the Gilets Jaunes, which people narrowed down to a price of gasoline debate. I think it's a much broader debate about social disengagement, the lack to, to of access to social services. And on top of that, the expectation that we all contribute to this uh, environmental and climate dimension, the recent energy prices, which are playing uh, a clear role and, and weighing heavily on those who, who can least afford those prices, but also the concept of social resilience and connecting it to uh, climate resilience. Those are things that are really important. And I think at the end of the day, if we don't merge them, we will not reap the benefits of a system that is based on social trust, on democratic debate, and on the expectations that we are really committed to the values of the European project. And for me, that is a social project as much as it is a project in any other direction. This, of course, does not fall from the sky because the European Green Deal is in a way uh, the European response to what we know as the SDGs, the Sustainable Development Goals, which have a very strong social dimension. I will spare you from a walk 
through all 17 of them. But in essence, it is about providing a decent life, you know, well-being within planetary boundaries. So it is the explicit linking at a global scale of a social dimension, a social set of objectives to planetary boundaries. Yeah? There is no long-term perspective if we cannot organize society within planetary boundaries. And it's not really stimulating me or a lot of other players to really go for environment and climate policies if they are in the end not delivering well-being uh, for 10 billion people on this planet. Uh, so that explicit linking, I think, is absolutely uh, critical. Then, in order to, uh, to get there, it has to be clear that the fixes of the past three, four decades, and those were based on efficiency gains and optimization of existing systems, will not get us there. We will need fundamental systemic sustainability transitions in core systems of the economy and society, the energy system, the food system. I don't narrow this to agriculture. It's the food system that we are talking about. The system of mobility, which is very unequal uh, in how it operates in many dimensions. And then you could say the infrastructure and, and industrial uh, system. So if we are talking about deep systemic transitions, that by definition has a strong link to economic reasoning and to the social dimension of economic reasoning, jobs, value chains, how costs and benefits are distributed along these value chains, unequal impacts, opportunities, and benefits. So all of these things are, in our opinion, absolutely uh, critical. And having a much better understanding of how this works is important. There is a big danger in uh, climate and environment policies that are trying to fix what we call technically externalities, uh, costs that are not in the price and that someone else somewhere else or later will pay. And that's, that's the simple explanation of an externality. If we are now creating social externalities in those transitions, which we have to deal with later, it's much more intelligent to incorporate and embed that social dimension from the get-go in the policies that we do. And that is what the Green Deal is partially trying to do with the renovation wave and uh, the social fund for regions that are going through an energy transition. And I think it could be uh, deployed uh, much more specifically to a much broader set of uh, ambitions. And just to give you one illustration, of how this plays out. And we are working with a number of partners on an atlas of the social distribution of the impacts of uh, environment and of pollution and of climate uh, change. And you immediately notice uh, across Europe the differences, but you can all, we will also work on income brackets and on uh, social conditions of people. And it becomes very clear that these things are unequally distributed. And so we need to have that type of knowledge to then start working on a set of policies that can address uh, this knowledge, uh, uh, these, these inequalities. We, we are also, uh, for example, trying to work with people in uh, occupational health, uh, OSHA, uh, the European uh, mm -hmm. uh, agency uh, in Bilbao that works on these issues. So there is a lot of work that needs to be done to understand better what this means. Then I would uh, like to also briefly mention the fact that uh, the sustainable finance uh, part of the uh, European Green Deal is often discussed uh, under the taxonomy. It's the most visible part of it. And we focus on the climate and environment taxonomy. But there is also, of course, a social taxonomy that is in the making. Yeah. Um, I know quite a couple of people are skeptical about it, but I think this is actually an essential opportunity uh, and we should collectively bring our knowledge to the table there to make sure that not only is this a third leg of the taxonomy, but that it is connected to the other two legs. So I think that is absolutely critical. And the role of capital and of investments is, is really fundamental here. If we don't shift uh, 
capital flows in an economy that is highly fluid when it comes to capital and investments toward more social and green dimension, I don't think we can reach the objectives that we need. So I would like to say that uh, in general, I think the social uh, dimension of the Green Deal is underestimated and not enough valued. Uh, at a time when that is badly needed, I also don't think that the current level of inequality, social exclusion, uh, and yeah, lack of social trust to a certain extent is a fertile ground for long-term sustainability, not on a planetary scale. I mean, nobody can convince me that the current planetary inequality can ever lead to long-term deep sustainability, but that is also not the case uh, in Europe. So we've got a fundamental agenda in dealing with a crisis that is called a climate crisis and a biodiversity crisis. And I think our only shot at doing this in a uh, not only acceptable, but also effective way is to link it to the other crisis in Europe. And that is a crisis of social cohesion, uh, exclusion and inequality. And uh, we are very motivated as a European Environment Agency to contribute to that debate and be partners with those who focus on the social dimension of that. Thanks a lot. Excellent. Thank you very much. Hans, I'll just take the computer work. If Stop the screen. Yes, thank you very much, Hans, also for a, a very timely uh, presentation in every uh, sense of that word. Um, for reminding us about the the goals, the ambitions of the of the, the Green Deal. Um, and you, as you and your colleagues write, describe in your chapter, it really represented a, a paradigm shift with regard to uh, a number of aspects. I, I noted down the business environment uh, joke that you made, but it's it's very telling. Uh, reminding us also of the, the sustainable uh, development goals and, and its uh, social dimension. Uh, and indeed, I, I think I completely agree with you that the social dimension of the Green Deal is largely underestimated and not sufficiently debated. So I'm also happy that today, I think also when we, when we had a look at the, the list of participants, uh, it seems that people focusing on the environment and people on focusing on the social dimension, whether they are analysts or policy makers, they're largely in separate worlds. And these are, these are, this is one of the uh, occasions, of course, to bring them together. So thank you so much, uh, Hans. We'll pass, uh, I'll pass the floor now to uh, Aida, Aida Ponder Castillo, a senior researcher at the ETY. Uh, Take the laptop um, and happy to listen to your presentation in the next uh, 15 minutes. And then after that, I remind the audience that there is a chance uh, if you want to pop some uh, factual questions, factions of uh, questions of clarifications about the who and the what and the where and the when and the why, etc. to both Hans and Aida, that you have the possibility to do that uh, and you will get more chance to intervene. Um, after the, the discussion with Ida. Please, Aida, floor is yours. All right, so thank you very much, Bart. It was a pleasure to provide this chapter to you and, of course, to the audience. Uh, today I will speak about the um, the European Commission's digital agenda. And to, to draft this chapter, I ask a question. Uh, because the digital agenda, it's a huge and a mixed bag of very different initiatives, which are directives, regulations, plans, uh, strategies and compasses, everything uh, in, uh, in one big uh, uh, title, which is the European digital agenda. And the question was, is it going to contribute to a more or less social Europe? And then in a nutshell, you have the summarize of the chapter in this slide, including the, the visual aid uh, at your right. Uh, what I did first is to map the digital agenda, all these uh, numerous um, initiatives. Then I collected knowledge from 11 civil society, civil, specialized civil society organizations who have knowledge and expertise on the digital itself, but also on the social. And from their expertise, I organized all the topics into four main areas. 
to, to give it a little bit of a more structure, which are inter interconnected to the all different mm -hmm. personas that we have in the digital. We are citizens, but at the very, uh, but but very, but we are always um, mixing between citizens, social media users, voters, uh, workers, entrepreneurs. Everything happens at the same time in the digital world. Mm -hmm. And then I identified the key social issues attached to that area. And from a science and technology uh, innovation studies perspective, I will provide some challenges, lessons learned, and conclusions. So. That's the map that I did of the digital agenda. In total, we have 30 drafted in a very specific time frame, which is 2020 and 2021 being tabled now, basically. So it's a, a, an absolutely admirable act of, of production from the European Commission. Uh, really, yeah, uh, chapeau to them. I focus only on eight of them that according to 11 civil society organizations are more linked to the social issues. Of course, we have uh, initiatives on 5G, on, on 6G, and on blockchain, uh, et cetera. But, we, but I decided to focus only on those which have, uh, have a link with the social aspect in which all our different identities or personas can be seen. And these are the 11 civil society organizations, of course, ETUC, Business Europe, but also uh, Access Now, who are advocacies on human rights, Article 19, who work on the freedoms of speech and freedom of no bill representing consumers, ECAS, empowering citizens to include, in order to create a more inclusive Europe, EDRI, the largest network of digital rights activists, ETUC Education, European Women's Lobby, the European Federation of Journalists, and Solidar focusing on social justice. All of these civil society organizations are very active when the European Commission is tabling initiatives, they are reactive, they have very specific and, and well-built uh, position papers. After, after having analyzed the eight legislative initiatives in this case, then I derived the main subject areas which are related to our different personas in the digital sphere. Uh, one dedicated to data, another one to education skills, another one to democracy, and the third one uh, related to the digital platform services and markets, including digital labor platforms. So to summarize uh, the, the initiatives, for example, we have the Data Governance Act, uh, in which uh, the, make, uh, the main um, criticism revolves putting aside people's interest in favor of economic benefits and promoting a lot of data sharing, data altruism. Please give, up, give me your data because it's for the common good. Um, then we have the AI Act, also a very uh, highly debated uh, legislative initiative in which several CSOs have identified a common shortcoming which is uh, that the AI Act is a product market regulation based on a very vague risk approach. It, you see, for example, has highlighted the lack of employment focus and Article 19 has highlighted the lack of human rights approach. Then we pass to the subject area number two dedicated to education and skills. And here we have the Digital Education Action Plan, which is a fantastic, of course, uh, idea but there are main three criticisms well expressed by ETUC Education, who identify the lack of involvement of social partners, where social partners already have an autonomous agreement on digitalization with a very specific chapter on skills as well. But the, the, the action plan uh, doesn't speak about that on Locally. The second criticism pointed out by Solidar is that the education should benefit learners themselves and not only the big tech. And of course, another big criticism is that digital skills need to be not only STEM or high level digital skills, but also basic and, uh, and cover the whole of the, uh, the population in the European Union to avoid a widening gap. We have also um, uh, the Digital Services Act, in the subject area related to digital services that is going to is going is actually being negotiating right now 
uh, heavily, heavily debated as well. Most of the civil society organizations have demanded that the platform business models should be regulated, which is completely absent of the DSA. And Edri, for example, advocates that platforms, online platforms, should not determine themselves what should be illegal. That's another point of contentions. And of course, there is no ban on advertising surveillance. And right now, I was hearing in the European Parliament the big problem of dark, dark patterns, meaning all these um, features in the websites that you visit as a consumer or as a voter that not be specific behavior on you. This perhaps and hopefully could be um, banned in the DSA. We also have the sister uh, direct uh, regulation, which is the Digital Markets Act, that applying to those uh, big platforms, the GAFAMs or gatekeepers. And here, um, the, the main criticism is that it overlook, overlooks the negative impact on individual users' rights. It has great sanctions and fines, but they are not liber um, uh, rights like interoperability, the right to move from service to service and to not lock me into one service provider, for example, WhatsApp. And then we have, uh, of course, the new directive just tabled this year, last year, uh, on improving working conditions in platform work. The directive at the moment is at risk because some groups of employers and other, other, other groups basically do not want this directive to, to be alive because it can hamper entrepreneurial uh, status and, and other self-employment um, <laughs> people. Whereas ETUC, for example, says, no, exactly that's the point. That, that objective of the directive is to avoid a bogus self-employment and to provide um, um, the presumption of of employment to those people living and working from the labor uh, that they provide within platforms, but also to provide rules on what exactly on what uh, makes platform work, platform work, which is algorithmic management, uh, which is an essential component of this phenomenon. We also have alongside with this uh, numerous legislative initiatives also uh, the framework agreements of social partners that they managed to sign also really after, during the pandemic uh, in 2020. I must say that this has been a great achievement, but also a very difficult achievement because it touches upon topics we, where very difficult to negotiate. The first one being data and uh, artificial intelligence, the right to connect and disconnect, skills, as I have said before, and practices such as monitoring and surveillance. So having presented all of that, um, uh, I have derived very specific key social issues that are attached to the main boxes in the middle of the diagram, which are really stemming from the social controversies, from the social questions, uh, that all these years of have asked around. Civil society organizations and social partners are not only the ones feeding into this digitalization process. We have activists and digital activists as emerging players in the digital transformation. They have burned as a subculture, but they do master the technology. And most importantly, because they know how it works, they know the risks and the potential risks to society. And today, they have proven actors influencing regulation. And we have seen it, and we are seeing it now in the Ukraine crisis. So in a nutshell, this is the summary of what is done in the chapter, visually speaking. The, in the external circle, the legislative initiatives, all the personas in which we deal in the digital world and the main themes and social uh, fit, um, key social issues that we have still to solve. And with that, I will close my intervention with three things, lessons learned, challenges, and a short conclusion. So lessons learned. There is a systemic flaw in, the, in crafting the digital agenda, which is 
It is it focuses on the market and on a digital sovereign Europe. It is never, it was never designed and will never be redesigned to address labor issues or human rights. The second uh, uh, lesson learned is that there is a lack of interconnection between the legislative initiatives themselves, for example, the DSA package and the AI Act, and for example, the, D the AI Act and the Directive on Platform Work, and for example, the whole of the digital agenda with the environmental agenda. <laughs> Um, the third point is that there is a lack of conversation between the social pillar and the digital agenda. The fourth one is that the draft directive on platform work, it is at risk. And um, there are two strong points of contentions, which are the employment stages and the rules on algorithmic management. And the fifth one, the fifth one is that we have seen a shift. Pure social actors do not have the sole property over social issues anymore. There are other emerging actors, such as activists, digital activists, and other expert CSOs that have a voice that is increasingly being heard. And this is a fact to be recognized, and maybe some alliances can be created out of that. So um, to, to close with, we have with the challenges that we still need to solve, uh, hopefully in this year, access. Access to the digital, access to the infrastructure, access from everybody, uh, highly skilled, less skilled, everybody needs to have some sort of access to the digital world. Algorithms, whether we interact with them at work, as consumers, when we visit a platform, Etc. Algorithms are there, not in sometimes behavioral that we are not aware about uh, of that. This needs to be clear and transparent and account and make people accountable for that. The issue about digital platforms as employers have not been addressed. The, the, the issue about digital platforms or the digital business model as such has not been addressed yet. So that remains a challenge. And of course, what's the agency of the social players or actors in all of the digital agenda? What's their agency? Where can we see them really interacting, influencing the debate, including, of course, those, those who are perhaps a little bit hidden, like activists and digital activists. So in a nutshell, to avoid further fragmentation and polarization of the society, I think, and I argue in this chapter that the European Commission should give more space to the anticipation of social issues, to the inclusion of very different perspectives in the society, to have a genuine participation of social partners and, to have, and public engagement as, an, as a very important ingredient of accountable, inclusive, socially shaped and human-centered technology governance. And with that, I thank you very much. Very much, Aida. If we could, if we would be in an actual meeting, we would now give you a round of applause, as of course uh, would have been the case for Han. We can do it after, yes. Here, at least from our end, we can do that. All right, thank you so much uh, for leaving us with your uh, the lessons learned and challenges. Uh, these are, of course, uh, immediately food for thought, for discussion, debate, uh, questions, and the, which will follow suit. Uh, I must say, as, an, as an, an, an editor of the book, and I think I speak on behalf also of, of Slavina, uh, we, we, re we really liked uh, the way that you, you summarized both in your presentation and, and in, the, in, the, in the chapter uh, in an intelligent, in an intelligible and intelligent way that the vast amount of initiatives uh, I, I, don't, I don't remember how many you said 30. 40 30 30 initiatives exactly uh, in, a, in an intelligible way uh, because the the label seems sim simple digital agenda but it's of course very complicated and as you say at the same time impressive and uh, you as you very nicely described um, uh, there are many uh, concerns uh, that have been raised and your discussion of how key uh, stakeholders have been dealing with these issues uh, is really um, worth reading. Hacktivists and digital activists, I think this is also something that is maybe, well, not entirely new, but I think that the, the depth of, of or your conclusion in the chapter also that these new organizations um, and actors to some extent are more influential now on the debate uh, than some of the traditional 
uh, actors, including social partners, is, is of course something that we should be uh, worry about also uh, uh, with regard, of course, to the, the trade union movement. Now, the thing is that uh, I was, I said that I would take some uh, questions immediately from the Q&A, but while, and that's a practical issue, while the presenters were on it, we didn't have uh, access to the computer. So for, for practical reasons, I think I will um, move now immediately to um, uh, the, our panelists, and then uh, it'll give us some time also to look at the questions in the Q&A. Uh, please, as uh, ETUI has uh, reminded all of you, please use the Q&A and not the chat function because it becomes a bit of a mess. It becomes difficult to, to manage everything that is in there. So please use the Q&A. So, but let's now first start. We have um, three uh, well-informed, um, excellent uh, discussions lined up for panelists, however we want to call them. So we have uh, Felix uh, Mayeux, who is an advisor at the European uh, Trade Union Confederation. Voilà, ici, uh, Felix, bienvenue. Uh, Felix, d'ailleurs, j'ai demandé à Felix d'intervenir en français, comme ça, uh, francophones pourront uh, le suivre en. So we then have uh, Kathleen uh, Miller, who is um, president of uh, Al Ai. I'm not sure how I should pronounce it, by the way, but uh, Al Ai, exactly. And she's also rapporteur on artificial intelligence at the European Economic and Social Committee. So good to have you on board, <laughs> Kathleen. Welcome in this session. And then finally, we have uh, Sebastiano uh, Sabato who is a colleague, senior researcher at the uh, European uh, Social Observatory and who will follow uh, uh, Sudan. So without further ado, Félix, je te rends uh, la parole pour plus ou moins cinq minutes. La parole est à toi. Bonjour à tous et un grand merci de, de me donner la parole et de m'avoir invité aujourd'hui. Euh, alors, je pense que j'aime bien commencer ce genre d'intervention par quelque chose de positif. Euh, et je pense que c'est important de se rendre compte que euh, énormément de travail a été accompli par la Commission européenne et par les institutions européennes quand on parle du Green Deal. Et ça, c'est quelque chose qui est euh, très euh, positif de, de, du point de vue de la CES parce que euh, quelques années après la prise de fonction de la Commission von der Leyen, on est dans un monde totalement différent quand on parle de politique climatique européenne et, et, et ça, c'est quelque chose de, de bienvenu. Euh, je veux juste rappeler que la CES euh, avait soutenu avant le Green Deal européen l'objectif de moins 55 euh, et donc c'est un événement important, le, le passage de cette loi climat qui euh, met dans la loi cet objectif de moins 55 euh, Et par ailleurs, on a été très actifs pour euh, demander à ce que la Commission euh, accompagne ce Green Deal européen d'un euh, agenda pour une transition juste, euh, pour, pour avoir une transition sociale. Aujourd'hui, dans mon intervention, je vais essayer de faire un peu, euh, un, en cinq minutes, un très court bilan euh, du Green Deal européen à la lumière de ses aspects sociaux, donc sans commenter trop euh, la question climatique ou environnementale, mais vraiment en regardant, tiens, est-ce que le Green Deal européen euh, répond à tous les défis sociaux qu'on a actuellement Alors, pour nous, en tant que CES, on voit cinq défis sociaux ou, ou relatifs au monde du travail principaux. Euh, le premier, bien sûr, c'est que les nouveaux emplois euh, qui seront créés, les nouveaux emplois verts, ne coïncideront pas toujours géographiquement avec les emplois euh, qui seront détruits euh, dans d'autres secteurs qui devront soit disparaître, soit se transformer. Et on voit que la Commission a souvent tendance à faire des estimations macroéconomiques globales en regardant le nombre d'emplois créés comparé au nombre d'emplois détruits et la Commission arrive à un, une, une évaluation positive en disant que globalement, on aura plus d'emplois créés que, que d'emplois détruits. Le problème, c'est que ça cache une grande disparité au niveau régional et donc il y a un risque pour certaines régions de désindustrialisation, euh, de, de, de hausse du taux de chômage, de pauvreté, etc. Et ça, c'est un aspect qui doit être mieux pris en compte dans les politiques publiques. Pour essayer de résoudre ce problème, la Commission a quand même fait quelque chose. Elle a créé le Fonds de transition juste qui était mentionné par, par Hans un peu plus tôt. Et ce fonds, c'est une, une bonne première étape. La CES avait demandé la création de ce fonds. Mais il faut se rendre compte que euh, la, la taille de ce fonds est complètement sous-dimensionnée par rapport au, au, au défi qui est, qui, est, euh, qui est devant nous. Parce qu'on parle de 18 milliards d'euros sur une période de 7 ans pour toutes les régions charbonnières et toutes les régions intensives en énergie. 
Pour vous donner une, une comparaison, l'Allemagne uniquement a décidé de budgétiser 40 milliards d'euros uniquement pour soutenir les régions charbonnières allemandes. Et donc ça, c'est quand même euh, un, un bon indicateur du manque d'ambition euh, à ce niveau-là. Un autre problème qu'on voit avec le fonds de transition juste, c'est que la commission a, maintenant que ce fonds a été créé, la commission a tendance à ramener tous les problèmes liés au monde du travail ou à la transition juste à ce fonds. Euh, et si on écoute la commission, euh, ce fonds devrait résoudre et financer tous les problèmes liés au monde du travail euh, quand, relatif à la transition climatique. Et ça, avec le budget actuel, ce n'est pas possible. Et par ailleurs, ce fonds n'est ne, pas destiné à aider d'autres secteurs comme l'industrie automobile ou le, euh, les, les transports publics, etc. Et donc, euh, ça, c'est aussi quelque chose qui, qui est un peu manquant. Le deuxième défi qu'on voit, euh, c'est que les nouveaux emplois créés ne, co ne coïncident pas toujours avec les compétences actuelles euh, du, des, des travailleurs. Euh, L'exemple typique, c'est un, 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 un mineur en Pologne ne peut pas du jour au lendemain euh, se, se convertir en, en ingénieur IT ou en, en, en technicien d'une éolienne. Et pour ça, on a besoin vraiment d'un plan, de plan de formation, de mapping des formations. Et il faut que les partenaires sociaux soient impliqués dans ces plans de formation pour que vraiment ils soient au plus proche de la réalité des travailleurs et, et qu'on qu réponde vraiment à leurs besoins. Là-dessus, le bilan du, du Green Deal européen, c'est que certaines choses ont été faites et certaines choses sont positives au niveau sectoriel, euh, notamment dans l'industrie automobile, il y a des choses intéressantes. Euh, mais par contre, ce n'est pas le cas dans tous les secteurs et ça, c'est quelque chose qui manque également. Un troisième défi, euh, et non des moindres, c'est que euh, ce n'est pas encore garanti que les conditions de travail seront aussi bonnes dans les nouveaux emplois qui seront créés que euh, dans les emplois actuels, euh, notamment dans les industries intensives en énergie, qui sont traditionnellement fortement syndiqués et qui ont pu, au cours des années, développer des, des conventions collectives de travail euh, pour, pour, pour les travailleurs. Euh, pour prendre un exemple, euh, je pense qu'il était d'ailleurs dans une publication de l'étui, euh, on sait qu'à niveau de qualification égale, un mineur polonais gagne environ 50% de plus qu'un travailleur dans le secteur de la construction ou, euh, ou dans, dans, dans le, le secteur tertiaire. Et donc ça, c'est aussi un autre défi, c'est que pour donner l'envie aux travailleurs de faire cette transition, il faut aussi leur garantir qu'ils auront des, bonnes, des bons salaires, des bonnes conditions de travail, de santé et sécurité dans ces nouveaux emplois. Et là, force est de constater qu'il n'y a pas vraiment d'agenda prévu de la, de la Commission pour, rendre, euh, pour garantir une, une représentation des travailleurs, des salaires élevés, etc., dans ces nouveaux secteurs. Euh, brièvement aussi, un quatrième défi, c'est que les politiques climatiques affectent euh, proportionnellement plus les ménages à faible revenu que euh, les ménages riches. Et ici, on parle d'inégalité, notamment devant des mécanismes tels que le prix du carbone, etc. Et ça, c'est également un problème parce que jusqu'à présent, la Commission essaye de financer cette transition climatique via des, une taxation environnementale ou ces mécanismes de, de prix du carbone. Nous, ce qu'on souhaiterait à la CES, c'est voir aussi une taxation du capital intervenir pour permettre justement de financer cette transition et pour permettre de la financer d'une manière qui est progressive, c'est-à-dire qui, qui taxe plus les ménages à haut revenu que les ménages à faible revenu et pas une taxe sur une taxe carbone ou un mécanisme de prix carbone qui, qui, est, qui affecte plus les autres. Dernière, dernier défi que je souhaitais aborder aujourd'hui, c'est qu'au-delà de, de l'atténuation du changement climatique, euh, les effets du changement climatique auront un impact direct sur les travailleurs et donc il y a besoin de politiques d'adaptation, y compris euh, au monde du travail. Et je prends l'exemple euh, de la hausse des températures qui affectera fortement la santé et la sécurité des travailleurs euh, dans le secteur de la construction, par exemple, qui travaillent euh, à l'extérieur. Et donc, il y a vraiment besoin d'une stratégie d'adaptation pour le monde du travail. Et ça, malheureusement, dans sa stratégie d'adaptation, l'Union européenne n'a pas pris en compte cette dimension, malgré les nombreuses recommandations qu'on avait proposées en tant que CES. Je m'arrête ici et j'espère ne pas, ne pas avoir été trop long et je suis content de, de répondre aux questions après. Excellent. Thank you so much, uh, Félix. Very uh, to the point. Okay, I would like to move on straight away to 
uh, Kathleen and Muller, and then so after these in initial interventions, we'll give the the speakers here, the authors, uh, some time to react, and then I'll collect some of the questions that are coming in through the Q and A. So please, Kathleen, the floor is all yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Um, I, I fully agree with uh, Aida Ponche that the European Commission, I'm, I'm going to talk about the digital agenda mainly uh, and, and with a focus on AI. Uh, and I fully agree with Aida that the, the Commission has gone on a uh, regulation spree with, uh, with its digital agenda. And a lot of the regulation is related to, uh, to artificial intelligence somehow. Uh, many people think that there is only the AI Act that deals with artificial intelligence, but this is uh, simply not the case. The Digital Services Act has elements of it. Uh, Platform Worker Directive has elements of um, uh, algorithmic management in it. And there's also one, I'm not sure if I saw that one on your uh, overview, either that is the Transparency and Targeted uh, Political advertising act um, that deals with political micro-targeting. Um, what I want to, I have little time and I want to be able to answer a lot of questions if there are uh, hopefully a lot of questions, but what I want you to, to, um, to, to give away at this point is, is th three things mainly. First of all, um, all the regulation and in particular the regulation from the European Commission, the initiatives that, that, that have come from the European Commission right now are based on what I call technological determinism, on the fact that apparently the Commission thinks that the technology is there, we have to deal with it, let's just deal with it. And the risk of that is that we um, normalize and mainstream a lot of uh, predominantly AI um, applications that are still under heavy, heavy scrutiny. And we should be very careful uh, by not giving all these types of tools that are, can be truly invasive for workers and citizens and, and, and voters and, and, and all these personas that we have, uh, the, the blessing of regulation. Regulation can be good, but regulation can also normalize a lot of things that we should consider not normalizing. Uh, the second, uh, the third thing is so the technological determinism, uh, the, the the blessing of regulation. I want you to remember that. And the third thing is that in many of the proposals that the European Commission makes, it seeks its solutions in transparency and consent. So it says basically, as long as the, as there is transparency about what we are decide, what a uh, system is deciding about you, or as long as you consent to the use of certain systems, uh, it is fine. Uh, on paper, this looks really nice, but in practice, I'm not sure how that is going to work. How are we, as consumers, workers, voters, um, going to be able to? understand everything that under the umbrella of transparency will be thrown at us, how are we going to be able to truly understand that? And how are we going to be able to consent to everything? And I think that um, trying to look at that, at those two elements as the solution for everything um, will not, will only complicate things for the ones at the receiving end of, uh, of the digital technologies. Um, but that's not to say that I, that I am against digital technologies or, art, or artificial intelligence in and of itself, quite the contrary. I'm also not against regulating it. I was a member of the high level expert group on artificial intelligence. And I now see that a lot of what we put laid down in the ethics guidelines for trustworthy AI has found its way into the AI Act. So um, the point is that we should be very, very uh, careful of how we regulate things, uh, how we make sure that we don't undermine existing legislation. I always say um, technology and artificial intelligence does not operate in a lawless society, and it never did. There's a lot of regulation that already exists. For example, if you look at labor regulations, a lot of the regulation that deals with our safety and our health at the workplace. Now that we introduce new regulations specifically focused 
on, for example, algorithmic management, where an algorithm takes over human management, aren't we then undermining the existing legislation that had dealt with human management and the safety and health of the workplace, the, the way we are hired, the way we are fired. We should be really careful with this uh, potential undermining process and this blessing of, uh, of regulation. Um, I, I would like to keep, um, to keep the floor open for a lot of questions, but those are the three things that if you want to remember one thing of today, remember technological determinism, the blessing of regulation, be careful with that, and transparency and consent is not always the full solution. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Katlena, for this uh, excellent and very clear three three points. I'll we'll move on straight away to Sebastiano Sabato, and then I'll bring in some questions from the Q and A and leave uh, the speakers ample time to to respond. Sebastiano, please. I see that you're in the office. Yeah. Thank you, Bart. Uh, good afternoon, uh, everybody. Yes, I'm uh, at the office. Uh, and uh, in these five minutes, uh, I would just uh, try to make a few considerations uh, and ask just a few questions uh, uh, on the two papers uh, uh, that I find very informative and uh, interesting. Uh, to start uh, uh, with the paper by Hans Brainings, uh, uh, I basically I like uh, the, the the chapter and uh, I um, agree obviously uh, with the importance played by the European uh, Green Deal uh, and I agree with the interpretation of the authors uh, that uh, uh, it's a, a systemic and encompassing agenda for sustainability, trying in a way at least uh, on paper to balance social, economic, environmental, and climate change uh, considerations. Uh, this uh, uh, then uh, uh, from the European Green Deal, as uh, described before, many initiatives uh, derives. Uh, so there is uh, uh, the need uh, to create coherence in this uh, systemic agenda. That nevertheless, it's a sustainability agenda, but it's the new EU growth strategy. So uh, my first point would be how to ensure that uh, this different dimension of sustainability mentioned in the European Green Deal, uh, the environmental, economic, and the social dimension uh, are integrated in what is uh, the bulk of uh, EU macroeconomic uh, governance. This is a key point. Uh, and uh, now we are discussing about the reform of EU economic governance. Uh, and my question is, uh, are we sure that we have all the instruments uh, in place uh, to push uh, simultaneously and in a coherent way these different uh, kind of objectives, environmental, social, uh, and economic? And uh, uh, from uh, uh, the social side, uh, I see that uh, uh, in the European Green Deal, uh, sometimes the reference to just transition is there. But uh, sometimes, uh, as also Hans said, uh, it's not uh, that clear. It risk uh, to be a bit of a slogan, uh, not to, to leave uh, anyone behind. Nobody should be left uh, behind. And uh, I see that uh, uh, with the time, the uh, uh, European Commission uh, in particular, but also other actors uh, are trying a bit uh, to transform this uh, slogan in concrete initiatives that are not perfect. As Felix said, the just transition mechanism, the social climate fund, uh, but also importantly, the proposal for a council recommendation on, the, on ensuring a, a fair transition towards uh, uh, climate neutrality. But uh, it's true that uh, a lot of work, uh, both by policymakers but also by academics, uh, is uh, still to be done. Uh, in a kind of understanding uh, how to link uh, the welfare state uh, to what are the needs of the green and of the digital uh, transition and uh, which ones should be the objectives. Let's not uh, 
forget that in a way the welfare state is linked in many respects to economic growth producing wealth to be redistributed and uh, here again uh, when reflecting on the main objectives during the green and digital transition in both chapters uh, there is a focus on the key objective of fighting inequalities uh, and uh, as a consequence on uh, redistribution uh, this is a, um, a key element uh, of the notion of just transition the second element of this notion and i conclude uh, is uh, how to ensure that the transitions, because at the European level, we talk about the twin transitions, so usually the green and digital, uh, how to ensure that uh, the transition builds on a, a public support and on a democratic uh, legitimacy. And here again, I would like to highlight an element that is highlighted uh, implicitly or explicitly in both the chapters uh, that is uh, an element to ensure the legitimacy of these transitions uh, is the important role that should be given to some process uh, such as uh, social dialogue and uh, civic dialogue to ensure that the citizens uh, are involved and support the process uh, but i would say that uh, also citizens are able to contest maybe some elements of the process because uh, as uh, Kathleen said, for instance, in the digital transition, we should uh, take everything for granted. Uh, she referred to this interesting notion of technological determinism and are decisions that uh, should be taken together in a democratic and participative uh, way. I would be happy to discuss this part there uh, later. Thank you again for your presentations and wish. Thank you very much, Sebastiano, for these very, um, very good points. So I think we already have a lot of beef on the table here. So maybe at this point, I see uh, Hans and uh, Aida taking uh, many notes. So maybe Hans will, will start with you, uh, integrating this uh, growth, uh, new growth strategy with the EU macroeconomic governance. Uh, the re is just transition, does it risk to be a slogan in the end? Public support for just transition, all of those elements, and of course, the, the key points that uh, Felix put on the table. And then we will move to you, uh, Aida, uh, for some of the other issues. So please, Hans. Yeah, I'll, I, thanks. Uh, thanks for the interventions. I, I thought they were really uh, brilliant. So I, I would like to respond to a couple of things very briefly. First of all, on the digital, uh, Katlena, I, I really liked your, your sort of questions also to Aida and, and Aida's presentation. Um, I do think that the connection with the sustainability agenda is clearly there. First of all, we expect, uh, some expect that the digitalization is sort of the deus ex machina that will deliver on sustainability, which is not the case. It will depend on what sort of digital uh, we bring to the table. And there, I would challenge Europe to say there are basically the, that market of digital economy is, is dominated by two models, the Chinese model and the US model. And the Chinese model is about control and the US model is about consumption to push it a bit. I think there is a space for a European model that is focusing on citizenship uh, and on sustainability. And that there is a huge space to, uh, to focus on those. And for that, indeed, we should not take this as a free market thing because there is no such thing as a free market. They operate in a regulatory and legal environment about property, ownership, liability, distribution, but also sustainability issues and on the green and environmental part. So I think there is a serious space to be filled uh, in there. The, the second uh, comment would be more on what Felix uh, brought to the table. Mm -hmm. I think you made exactly the point of why we need an explicit discussion about this social dimension of the green transitions. It is about jobs. It is about uh, skills and competences. It is about distribution. 
it is about regions that are losing uh, 150 years of uh, a specific industrial history and all of that. So uh, efforts to link these two agendas and to make them explicit, I think are absolutely uh, critical. And I, I think you made many good points. Uh, I, I would make one footnote and I say it half jokingly, the Polish mine worker who makes 50% more than his colleague in another industry, uh, I would also like to look at the life expectancy, the healthy life years and, and other things, but that, that's another uh, discussion. Yeah. And then finally, um, on this growth strategy and macroeconomics, uh, it, we recently did a report on the macroeconomics of sustainability transitions. And we focus very much on this notion of uh, well-being economics. What is the teleology of an economy? Is that it delivers well-being to, to people? And, and that is a translation of the beyond GDP uh, discussion. And we know that the correlation between GDP and, and the, the welfare state has is there. And I personally consider the European welfare state model probably as the highest expression of political modernity in the European context. And we, we all, been, or most of us benefited from it. I would not be sitting here if it were not for the welfare state. Huh? Uh, so that is great. At the same time, over that period, it was based on uh, systems of production and consumption that have brought us into problems with the planet, if you could say so. So connecting those two again, it's all about connectivity, <laughs> well-being economics within the limits of the planet, where the real challenge is. And I'm very glad that you mentioned redistribution uh, and fairness as a central notion there. And I think that leads us to a triple transition. That is the green, the digital, but also the social slash societal transition. And understanding how those are connected, I think, is, is really uh, the way forward. And, and what I really liked about Haida's notion was sort of the, the, the hybridization of social life. I mean, when we grew up, I'm of course ancient by now, but uh, <laughs> when we grew up, friendship was a purely social notion. Now, friendship in, for younger people, in groups of friends do not exist without the mediation of technology. So it becomes a socio-technical notion. And you see that hybridization in all sorts of parts of society. So I think that is also a challenge for us to get grip in, you know, to understand it, respond to it, and to connect it to those other big challenges. Well, I bet I've spoken too long probably already, but uh... you've spoken exactly the time you needed to speak. Thank you so much, Han. So I Aida, back to you now. Uh, so very important issues put to the table indeed by, by Kathleen with regard to technological determinism, problematizing transparency, uh, consent and other notions and, and linked in this respect also what Sebastiano brought in about uh, uh, legitimacy, please. Thank Aida. you Bart and of course, thank you uh, Kathleen for your brilliant ideas and, uh, and concepts. I think that what you call technological determinism um, we can find in the Commission's um, narrative when the Commission explains that the digital agenda is about technology that works for people, um, as a side joke, of, of course, as well, as another slogan to the digital agenda. So technology that works for people, uh, it's, um, it's clearly uh, the, uh, the vehicle of te technological determinism, quite clear. I, however, I have to say that I have 20 years of experience working with the regulation of emerging technologies. And this is clearly the first time that I see this, uh, their regulation or um, um, abuse on the use of the technology as such through so-called regulatory instruments. I will say why I don't think they are regulatory instruments. Uh, in regulating other technologies in previous years, I didn't see that. Uh, regulations that we have before were very much based on a precautionary principle approach, on anticipation, on anticipatory technology approaches. And this is why at the end of my chapter, I say, well, it's a pity that the European Commission didn't took that path that it took in the past. 
Um, why I think is in particular AI, and, and you know it very well, Kathleen, is not a regulatory, a, a genuine regulatory approach because the commission serves of a very interesting regulation in order to uh, say that at the end, the regulatory obligations under the AI Act, for example, will be operationalized through technical standards that will be crafted or are being crafted in international <laughs> organizations like ISO, which then leaves us with very, very little space for a true democratic uh, bargaining of, of the policies of the regulations, of, uh, for a very little space for exercising rights but which rights will work? The ones that we might have already. We don't have new digital rights at the moment, except for perhaps the platform work directive, if it comes as it is proposed. So yeah, it's a, it is, we are living in a very fragile moment with this uh, sense of regulating technology, which in my mind, it is not as such. Uh, transparency is being portrayed as the... Um, uh, <laughs> Wonder Woman of digital technologies. Because I'm transparent, I'm good. Uh, well, the problem with transparency, and I agree with you, Kathleen, is that it's an action that comes unilaterally from the provider of the service of the, or of the product. Please be transparent. I am transparent. Yes. So what? What we do? What do we do as consumers, as voters, as citizens with that transparency? Nothing. We have absolutely no right to exercise in order to contest or to have a redress mechanism towards the so-called transparency uh, documents or measures that any provider is apparently obliged to provide. On the side of the authorities, I wonder in the social area, in the employment area, a labor authority, what would that do? Would, what would a labor authority would do with an algorithm? with the transparency of a black box or with the transparency of a very specific technical process? Mm -hmm. Where can we demonstrate that the very specific violations on labor rights or other social rights have been done because of the, the ways the systems and the algorithms perform? So yes, transparency is a, it's a word that is being misused and uh, unluckily it's finding its way through the regulatory process. And, uh, and yeah, I think uh, this is it, really. Okay, excellent. Thank you. Thanks to both of you. Uh, the two colleagues on my right-hand side are dying to intervene, I feel that. But there are also a number of very good questions on the, on the Q&A. So hold your horses for one more second, Nicola and Sabina. So I'll just um, pick up some of the, the questions on, on the Q&A, both for, for Hans and, and Ida. Maybe first for, for Hans, uh, since we started in that order, that's fine for you, Ida. Um, so Willy, Willy de Bakker uh, from 3E Intelligence uh, says, should the EU not redefine its EU Green Deal agenda as a security agenda instead of a social agenda? The war should be a wake up call for um, reframing. So thank you for, uh, for that, Willy. Jean Moore, uh, Hans, uh, still with you, um, says, Great input as always. I suppose you and John uh, know each other and I'm sure. Uh, John writes, the process, the process and fair outcomes of just transition are both important. What will galvanize the public and policy makers to engage in a positive way to create the social transition needed and increase rapid climate uh, action? And she's concerned, of course, that war, energy, and prices price rises will not help to shape this in uh, the near future. And then I'll bring in a third question to you, um, Hans, if I find it um, back. Um, yes, from uh, Ilias Iacovidis. Uh, Hans, what are the challenges and opportunities for accelerating sustainable transition? That the current crisis, the war in Ukraine, uh, in Ukraine creates. So uh, this is obviously an issue that many people are um, concerned about. So these, I think, would be the most important questions um, to you. I'll first um, maybe also list a few questions for Ida. Then you can also already uh, prepare that a little bit, Ida, and then we'll get back to you to, to answer them. So uh, first of all. Yeah, Willie is being very active and we like that, Willie. So thanks for that uh, to Ida. Where is the link between the digital agenda 
and the EU's challenge of decarbonization and planetary limits. Why no mention of the work of Vendetta Brevini? I'm not sure I know the work of Vendetta Brevini, but I'm sure uh, you do. So that's the first question from uh, Willy the Bucker. Um, um, also question to you, Aida from uh, Ilias uh, Lakovidis. Uh, excellent job, he says, first of all, in analyzing digital initiatives um, with regard to the missing uh, social issues. So thank you for that compliment. Aida. Are you or is anybody else at ETY looking at the digital initiatives with regard to environmental issues, so linking uh, the motivations. That's a very good and very um, relevant question. Warda has another question for you, Aida. You underline uh, a lack of conversation between digital and social agenda, indeed. Moreover, I observe that digital issues and environmental ones are also treated separately, as we mentioned before. Unfortunately, Warda says, Job opportunities linked to circular economy, for instance, but what about digitalization and job, loss, job losses? Could you comment? And I'll maybe just bring in one more question. I think then you have enough on your plate. Um, namely from Renat Hansens, who is a colleague from uh, the Belgian Christian uh, Trade Union Movement. Good to have you on board today, Renat. Uh, he asks uh, to you, Aida, are hacktivists aware enough and busy with social aspects of digitalization? Or are they foremost busy with civil rights, privacy, and consumer rights? As a consequence, shouldn't trade unions intensify the dialogue with hacktivists to explain more our perspectives? And I think that's a very good and relevant point. There are other questions, but I think, again, we have you have quite a bit on your plate. So uh, Hans, and I know that then uh, Svenida and Nicola would like to jump in as well. But it's good. We are still perfectly on time. Hans, for example. Okay, well, thanks for uh, the questions. First of all, redefining the Green Deal as a security uh, agenda. I think it is all about human security. I mean, the, the concept of security has, is multi-dimensional. And I actually, almost 30 years ago now, did my my doctoral research on the link between the environment and security and a lot of what i see in the green deal now is essentially about securing an environment that allows for fundamental human security it's about food security it is about uh, living in a place that is not threatened uh, by climate change it is uh, preventing uh, serious conflicts over resources, environmental degradation, and thus also flows of environmental <laughs> and climate <laughs> refugees. So I, I uh, think it is in essence about human security. Where I would draw the line is where uh, some uh, academics primarily speak about the securitization of the environment and of climate, because then it gets captured in a logic that is not necessarily very conducive. I will link it to the third uh, question, and that is about uh, challenges and opportunities for accelerating transitions mm -hmm. because of the Ukrainian crisis. Well, it is quite obvious, I think, that uh, the rather quick response by the European Commission, but also by the, the, the Council and the member states, uh, was where reflections about our energy system, our energy dependence, about the need to step away from that dependence, not only by in the short term shifting to other uh, suppliers, but, but to go fundamentally to a, a decarbonized uh, energy system. Uh, the same is true about reflections about uh, natural resources, where the idea is not only to get those resources from somewhere else than Russia or the Ukraine, but also to stimulate the model of circularity in the economy and to fundamentally uh, dematerialize part of the economy. But there is, a, for me, an equally fundamental element. And, and it's not based on work that we do as an agency, but more my own background as, as a political scientist also is, for me, it underlines also the necessity uh, to have a fundamental discussion about democracy. 
Yeah, it, I mean, we have incredible challenges ahead of us and we've discussed it today. I think the big challenge for Europe is to illustrate convincingly that as democratic societies, we can deal with these challenges because I refuse to accept the notion that authoritarianism, whether it's in a light form or in its totalitarian expression as we see today, also can ever be an answer that will satisfy me as a citizen. I, I, I will never accept that notion. So it's a democratic challenge that we are facing. And that brings me seamlessly to the third question. How do we uh, motivate citizens to be part of uh, this uh, transition? I think it is, first of all, by treating them as citizens. <laughs> Way too many times I'm in panels and I'm reduced to being a consumer. Yeah. How do we involve the consumer? Well, excuse me, uh, stop, stop reducing me to being a consumer. I'm a citizen. And as a citizen, I expect my institutions to push for sustainability in the regulatory system. And within that, then I will make my choices as consumer. And then I go for price or taste or volume or whatever I find important. But I expect different things from a system as a citizen than as a consumer. So stop treating me and reducing me only as a consumer. That's one thing. And secondly, involve citizens in understanding things. We don't only need to explain better to citizens what the situation is, but involve them in creating their own understanding of where we stand. For example, the Curious Noses uh, uh, initiative in Antwerp involved a thousand citizens with very cheap citizen science technology to understand air quality in their own environment. Yeah? They built the knowledge base and it shifted the debate about, is it in poor neighborhoods that there is poor air quality or not? How is this linked to social distribution issues? How can, what can we do about the situation that we now understand? So I think more and more we should treat citizens in a way that involves them rather than thinking that if we explain it better to them, they will exercise the citizenship uh, rights they have in a democratic system. Okay, thank you very much, Hans. Um, Aida, the floor is yeah, yours. And yeah. maybe just to frame, of course, that uh, after these, uh, these feedbacks, if uh, Felix, uh, Kathleen, uh, and or Sebastiano want to uh, jump in with uh, some comments on what has been, been discussed, uh, by all means, uh, the floor is yours. But first, uh, to you, Aida, just I'll, I'll add something. I, don't, I can't read the name because it's in another uh, script. But do you think that the digital platforms will disrupt the way trade unions uh, work nowadays? It's of course linked to the question that was uh, raised before. But while you're at it, you might want to comment on that. And if Felix wants to intervene on that question, that would also, of course also be welcome. Aida, please. Yeah, they are already doing it now, I guess, with the digital labor um, initiatives. Uh, yes, of course. But maybe I would like mm -hmm. just to quickly link to what Hans just said about being critical actors in society. It happens uh, for consumers who are labeled by the EU institutions as consumers, and they very difficulty, they very dif with difficulties, they make the difference between uh, our different personas and identities. Uh, when maybe Catalan knows this more, but uh, when it's when we're discussing about the AI Act, uh, but this, but this, it, the, 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 the official says it doesn't have to do with the workers. Yes, <laughs> but exactly, uh, you are not consumers. Yes, workers are not consumers. Workers are workers, and they have a different uh, agency uh, and a different way in which the regulations uh, impact them. So building this critical understanding mm -hmm. and critical assessment, not to become data scientists or technologists, but just to have this awareness of how air pollution impacts you the same way how an algorithm can impact and not the behaviors of you should be, should be enabled within these dialogues at any level when we speak about democracy uh, and all the sorts of democracy, whether it's in the environment or in the digital world or in the digital transitions, the triple one. So uh, uh, Hans, well, by the way, I, um, I might bring the, the question to you because the question for me was, is there a link between the digital um, agenda and the deco decarbonization? The only paper that I 
I clearly remember, and it was a short article, was in your website <laughs> when some of your colleagues wrote about the uh, enormous amount of energy that servers and, and plants mm -hmm. in Iceland and everywhere else are consuming. But besides that bit of the, that the energy, European Energy Agency did at the time, which was like 2017. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's some time ago. Yeah. Some time ago. I haven't seen much. Well, I, I, yeah, if I, if I may, extremely, it was a central point in the German presidency to link these two agendas. There is a brilliant report written by uh, a German uh, scientific institution on it. I can share it uh, if, if you want to. The essential point is, and what, I mean, the greening of the IT system per se as an industry, like all industries need to decarbonize, that's one thing, but then what do we use it for? Mm -hmm. We're all haunted by this little thing. When I look at it, I don't have the impression that it's focusing on making me a more digital citizen. Yeah? <laughs> it's trying to push consumption. It's spitting out all sorts <clears throat> of information, whether I want it or not. It takes some skill to get rid of all of that. But I think we, and, and of course, there are a number of applications that make us more sustainable. But again, it depends on how we use it and how we regulate it and where we want to drive and push it and how strong we want to make that connection. Thank you, Hans. So to answer to Willis' questions, yes, Benedetta Brevini, it's a researcher uh, working in the uh, University of Australia, who just last year wrote a very interesting book about the planetary boundaries of the AI uh, consumption. Uh, very, very tiny, well, very short book, really in, written in a journali journalistic, journalistic style, where she explained how the decarbonization of servers and the whole narrative behind how GAFAM say we pitch on the decarbonization agenda doesn't really happen. Uh, it's very interesting. So I, I recommend you everyone to read that book by Benedetta Brevini. Um, I am not, uh, ETUI Elias is not yet looking at the digital initiatives linked to environmental issues, but now I think we will start doing that more systematically because then it will be another huge work and will be extremely interesting to do. Um, uh, for, for LARDA, there is a lack of conversation between uh, the digital eye and the environmental. Uh, what about job losses? Yes, okay. So job losses, <laughs> the big elephant in the room. Mm -hmm. And the question that we have asked before we started dealing with automation, blah, 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 many years ago, but uh, colleagues from uh, in the University of Oxford and from the OECD estimated, I don't know, Nicola, how many job losses? I cannot remember the figures. In any case, th these estimations have been going up and down. They are not clear enough. We don't know in which sectors we're going to have job losses. The point here is that the narrative behind the European Commission uh, uh, digital initiative is, is not about job losses. It's about how to reskill, no, excuse me, how to provide digital skills and make women more capable to enter into the STEM, uh, uh, STEM uh, science, how to make uh, mm -hmm. high level entrepreneurs to provide uh, skills to make this digital agenda strong. Just about that. You, you forget about basic digital skills. No question about who has access to internet, who has computers in their home. It's not about that. So that reframing of the job losses through, let's solve it with the skills, mm -hmm. it's the avenue to go for, in my interpretation. Activists, thank you, uh, Renat, for this uh, question. Yes, mm -hmm. they know that they, have, they know their business. That's why they are activists or digital activists in a way. They have been there, hidden, since many years ago. Now they are putting the hoodie back and showing in a way their faces or their power. Indeed, they know a lot about human rights and privacy issues and data protection because that's their core business. But even though they are not experts in the social, mm -hmm. they start to have an understanding that something is happening in that area. And 
as a primer, if I may, Nicola, we are going to publish in very few months a working paper at ETUI about how to unpack algorithms that are being uh, nurtured behavior in digital level platform workers. So that's the work of a digital activist who has taken the algorithm and explained to us in common words what happens when a digital level platform is managing you through an algorithm. So that will uh, come really shortly. Just wait for our news in our website. And yes, they should have more. They are relevant, but I, I, I think that uh, the trade union movement and other civil society organizations should be working together because they can cross fertilize each other from the social aspects to the more technical and vice versa, from the environmental to the technical and to the social and vice versa. Now in this triple um, um, transition, as Hans pointed out, we cannot just work in, in separate fields of expertise and we need to become united with that. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. I, I want to see at this stage whether um, our panelists, so Felix, uh, Katlena, or I see Katlena raising her hand. So please jump in. First come, first serve. Yeah, thank you very much. I, I just want to um, um, to add something uh, to what uh, Aida just said about uh, what I really like is different personas and, and also uh, maybe what Hans said, please don't look at me as a consumer only we are we are citizens we are voters we are workers we are we are parents we are children we are we we can have so many different personas and we have so many relations also with um with society with each other with organizations with 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 governments etc and what you can see that um if we talk about ai and algorithms that the european commission is now doing in the AI Act is trying to deal with all these personae at once, if you will. It, it is trying to deal, it, it, it has developed a, a list of, of domains in which it considers certain AI tools and AI systems to be high risk. So there, there should be all kinds of requirements that these systems should comply with before they can put on the union market. And what you see is that, uh, in these domains, you see education as a domain. So that is where we are students. You see work in this domain, uh, hiring uh, uh, human resources, but also algorithmic management is already mentioned on the high risk list. So this is where we are workers. You see um, the enjoyment of essential private and public services. So um, think of uh, the enjoyment of social benefits. This is where we are citizens in our relationship to, uh, to governments, but also the enjoyment of, uh, of housing, energy, electricity, where we are, well, I would say in some countries consumers, maybe in other countries, this is, this is organized by the state, but where we are consumers towards these large essential services providers. We see um, AI in law enforcement. This is where we are or can become suspects, for example. We see AI in democratic processes on this list. This is where we are voters um, in the judiciary. So this is where we are in courtrooms defending ourselves or claiming things. So all these personae are already integrated in this in this very large, um, large act. And this is where I, I say that we should really be involved. Everybody should be involved from all sides and all corners of society in the discussions around this act because it's gonna affect everything. And we should also really um, demand from the European Commission and then the negotiators in the trilogue to explain to us because what the commission says is it is high risk but because of the fact that we see some benefits in these uses, we will allow them. But to mitigate any risk that still might arise, we have these requirements. And once you, you, you comply with these requirements, you're all, you're all good. So uh, an important question to ask there also is, 
do these requirements indeed take away any of these risks that the systems pose? Because if they don't, then the system that the commission is trying to set up is not working. Um, so, so really, I really like your your uh, your approach, idea with the with the with the persona and 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 the fact that we are not just consumers, but this is also something that we should be really keen on. This is what the Commission also sees and also already wants to regulate really quickly with this AI Act. Thank you very much, Katlina. Looking at whether oh, Sebastiano, okay, please. Yeah, very shortly, thank you for your comments. I want just, uh, uh, you know, uh, yes, the issue that Hans uh, raised, uh, the issue of democracy is uh, fundamental. Uh, we should uh, be able uh, to do those transitions, to do it our way, European way, that there should be a democratic <laughs> way, but also as a uh, underlined in uh, the chapter, we have here the issue of timing, that is uh, uh, the timing uh, of the problems uh, uh, that is, uh, for instance, uh, for environmental deterioration and climate change, decisions need to be taken uh, and soon, uh, and the timing of liberal democracies that need some time for their decision making and discussions, we should be able to balance these needs uh, and uh, there are uh, no shortcuts. And in this case, uh, uh, I think and I repeat uh, uh, on the importance of uh, institutional settings, but also of uh, social dialogue and civil dialogue, because uh, I agree with what I said uh, on the importance, not only to ex explain, but also to involve citizens uh, in uh, uh, decision making uh, uh, about uh, these uh, challenges and decisions taken. And I think that uh, this, at the end, somebody has to decide, but uh, a participatory process as much as possible for me is uh, challenging, uh, but also important and vital, especially for the European Union, because uh, we know that sometimes Brussels uh, is perceived uh, as a far from uh, the member states uh, and uh, from some citizens at least perceived. So uh, it's uh, we should find a way and it's difficult in some cases for the European Union to communicate well and involve because otherwise uh, we will see and we have already seen uh, phenomena of blame shifting uh, to EU institutions. Uh, I mean, uh, we already saw even before the uh, invasion of Ukraine, yeah. citizens and political forces uh, shifting the blame for uh, unpopular uh, decisions on EU institutions. For instance, uh, fuel, uh, the increase of fuel price already before in the rhetoric of some institutions in some actors at national level was uh, this is a consequence of the Commission's Green Deal. Thank you very much, Sebastiano. Felix, you want to put a final comment very briefly because we need to wrap up? Yeah, sure, but I think going in the same direction, uh, I like the comments uh, in the chat that says when it comes to just transition, uh, the process is as much as important as the result. Uh, and I think here we should explore much more democracy at work to, to, to tackle this issue of climate change. Uh, because that's where actually people can also change the company from the inside. And one of the challenges is to really bring this topic of how to move towards uh, energy efficiency, reduction in greenhouse gas emission, protection of the environment at, on the company level with the and develop just transition plans with the workers or trade union representative and the employers. And I think that's one of the challenge we have. The TUC is trying to propose to the commission some concrete legal propositions to achieve that. But so far, uh, unfortunately, the commission hasn't uh, taken this on board. Okay, okay, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Felix. There were quick questions here from Slavina and Nicola, very briefly, and then the two speakers have one minute for a final session. So please. 
Very briefly, Slavina. Okay. Yeah, good afternoon, everybody. First of all, thank you very much, especially for presenting these so complex issues in a so pedagogical way in the chapters and now during your presentations. And I, I have two questions. The first one is to Hans. So let's go back to this question of food security. Uh, as we know now in the context of the war in Ukraine, and we know that the country provides over a third of the world's wealth and uh, barley. Uh, so uh, there have been discussions around Europe's food security, notably the role of the EU's uh, main sustainable food um, programs, such as the farm to fork and the biodiversity strategy that you mentioned. So do you think that we may go towards relaxing sustainability goals uh, in this EU's policies in this context. And then Aida, um, thanks a lot for your chapter. I think I found finally somehow grasped uh, the digital agenda of the, of the EU. And uh, indeed, as you, as you show, there is not a social project behind uh, underpinning this uh, agenda. But you also mentioned uh, that there is no interconnection between the various digital legislative initiatives. And as a political scientist, I would like to know a bit more you know, about the black box of, of the commission. Of Why do you think this is the case? Why the DGs don't communicate with each other, lack of staff, et cetera? So if you could say something like that, thank you. And all of this in one minute. Thank you. Good question. Nicola, please. Um, <clears throat> I would like to echo uh, the uh, congratulatory remarks that we've managed to uh, share with us so much information in such a short uh, uh, period of time. It's, it's really impressive and uh, so digestible. Thank you. Uh, I have a question uh, for Hans, and I'm going to put it out in the most pro provocative way I, I can. I completely agree with what you said in terms of uh, uh, the Green Deal and just transitions uh, really taking the, the focus of reducing negative externalities as far as possible. Uh, the points that Felix was making about the funds uh, fit very well within that. This idea of, you know, no one, no one should be left behind uh, uh, as a consequence of uh, the transition. But I was wondering whether this is really the right, I'm, I'm sure it's a, the correct description. I wonder whether strategically this is how we can achieve um, a transition to a sustainable climate and environment, and whether, in fact, we shouldn't turn it on its head, whether the real problem is not you know, that the level of inequalities that are generated by the process and how to mitigate them, whether the real problem is the current level of inequalities, mm. and whether the current level of inequalities are the real obstacle to uh, a green transition, to uh, a just transition, to sustainability, and whether we shouldn't, as, as, a, as an imperative, fix current levels of inequality, mm -hmm. at least to a degree that will make sustainable the green agenda. Because at the moment, I do not see that happening. And I suspect what Felix said about as soon as there is a fund, everyone tries to find all the so solutions uh, through that fund is a reflection of precisely this problem that we have uh, somehow gotten the order wrong. Um, we first need to fix the increasing levels of inequality in European societies in order to have a green transition rather than the other ground. So now, Hans and Aida, you have a terrible, terrible, terrible job to do, namely many good comments, very good questions. And you have one minute for a final statement. That's very tough, but it can be done. Come on, please. <laughs> okay, Slavina, I, I don't think that we should relax sustainability criteria for the food system or any other mm -hmm. system. We've made great strides forward in food security over the last 40, 50 years, but they were based on systems of production and consumption that were unsustainable. It is now time that we need to bring those two uh, together. And there is a, there is a massive literature on, on how that can happen in the food system. And Nicola, um, 
I think we live in a system, and it has been said before, that overvalues financial capital, undervalues social capital, and hardly values natural capital. Yeah. And so rather than uh, having a system of an economy that can draw on society, that's how we explain it, and we teach mm -hmm. our students to contribute to the economy yeah, rather than becoming citizens, an economic system that can draw on society and then almost endlessly thinks that it can draw on natural capital, we should accept that natural capital is a foundational capital on which we build healthy societies for which we need an enabling economy. And if we can, mm -hmm. if we can turn the logic upside down, I don't think it's a matter of order. Should we first solve inequality there and then deal with the other issues? They need to go hand in hand. And to put it in one number, if we would have paid a lot more attention to the Gini coefficient than we had, and not only focus on the GDP, I think we would be in much better shape when it comes to your question. Thank you, Hans. Aida, your final statement, one minute. Thank you, Varda. Thank you, Slavina. Well, I don't have a very scientific answer to why the digital agenda seems to be fragmented. But my understanding is because of three reasons. First, the urgency of the European Commission to become leader, absolute leader, in a geopolitical war on the digital at all costs. Mm -hmm. That includes, for example, microconductors, semiconductors, chips being manufactured not in the EU, mm -hmm. and which are the bone of the artificial intelligence systems and platforms, we don't mm -hmm. have them. And we need to have them back at somehow. Second, the regulation, the regulatory mandate that the commission has in regulating anything, special digital, less is more. And of course, this field, this digital topic is highly, uh, um, uh, 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 people like it a lot, mm -hmm. including the big bosses at the European Commission. Mm -hmm. So there is a pull and, and, and push between who owns the file. And we have seen it very clearly with uh, Commissioner uh, Thierry Breton, mm -hmm. responsible for internal market, and Commissioner uh, Margareta Vestager, in, 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 uh, responsible for the digital. They're pulling and pushing the file. Other commission is coming to, <laughs> into the wave, and this is why it looks as it is being debated. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you so much uh, for a very concise and clear answer. And we, we, I noticed in the list of registered participants that there are many commission officials from very different uh, DGs. So maybe this, uh, they, 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 will, they could comment on this, but we don't have the time for that now. So we, we've come to the end of, of a very interesting seminar. I'm, I'm really very happy with, uh, with the debate here. Um, but of course, uh, so today, Slavina, we zoomed in on uh, two of the chapters of, uh, of our book very important ones, uh, on the digital um, and, and, and the Green Deal, um, climate change, digital agenda. But of course, uh, this book, uh, which is now there in, in two languages indeed, uh, had a much broader, uh, much broader uh, remit. Uh, the, we, we, we discussed also uh, uh, big changes in the, in the way the use fiscal policies, uh, health policies, we discussed, especially in the conclusions which we wrote together, issues of uh, the important issue of winners and losers from the pandemic. Uh, so maybe Slavina, you can um, uh, explain to us um, uh, the, the, key, the key findings of, uh, of the book and the overall conclusions as we wrote them down. Again, as an appetizer, of course, for the audience to pick up the book and to actually start reading. Please, Slavina. Thank you, Bart. And uh, in the book, in the conclusions, we identify uh, four big policy shifts. So uh, those that we just discussed, the digital transition and the uh, Green Deal. But we also, um, we've been uh, also uh, concluding on important shifts in EU fiscal and health policies due to the pandemic. And the chapter by Cinchia Alcidi and the Francesco Corti from SEPS demonstrates that the pandemic broke several long-standing taboos in use fiscal policies. And we see that the stability and growth pack, one of the holy cows of the EU, is still on hold. Moreover, the member states finally uh, took the first step towards uh, the creation of a fiscal stabilization, stabilization uh, instrument, the so-called uh, sure mechanism.
And importantly, um, the vast EU recovery program will be partially funded through the issuance of common EU debt, which before was unimaginable. So even if it was heartful, the EU showed uh, emblematic solidarity, which was unimaginable, uh, as I said before <laughs> the pandemic. But there is more. Uh, the EU is now pushing the member states towards public investments rather than towards austerity policies. And never, uh, nevertheless, the question is whether these measures, in great contrast to the management of the 2008 uh, crisis, uh, point to a lasting paradigm shift. Let's see. The measures are temporary and therefore uh, fragile. Uh, important changes also took place regarding health policies. Um, the EU has taken a much stronger coordination and steering role once again because of COVID-19. And Thibaut de Ruel uh, in his chapter calls uh, this uh, paradigm and institutional shift. We know that the Commission advocates a European health union. Nevertheless, uh, this would mean that powers of public health uh, need to be shared between the member states and the EU. And we all know how difficult uh, treaty changes are, and especially uh, now uh, when 10 member states have already flagged that boosting EU powers uh, in health is a no-go area. Mm -hmm. And so these two policy shifts linked to the pandemic bring me to another central question of uh, this year's uh, Bilan Social, which is the question of the winners and the losers of the pandemic. And when we started the book last year, we knew that evidence on that would be scarce by, 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 by now. But we absolute, absolutely wanted to make a first evaluation in exactly these terms, who are the winners and who are the losers of the pandemic. And the result is quite telling as we read in the chapter of uh, Michael Dauderstadt, uh, well, to put it bluntly, uh, there are mainly losers and very few winners. And uh, let's look at the losers at the national level, uh, sectors such as transport, accommodation, and food services declined by at around 80% in 2020. There was also, we all know, a collapse in tourism and in employment. And then the Southern countries, uh, where this sector is essential are among the um, biggest losers of the pandemic. And regarding the population groups, unsurprisingly, the hardest hit by the pandemic are young people, women, and people on low income. And uh, clearly those under the age of 25 are among the biggest losers as youth unemployment rose sharply to at around 18% in August 2020, which is enormous. And moreover, young people also suffered, we know, uh, from the successive lockdowns and they lost their societal markers. And all this led also to far reaching consequences for young people's uh, mental well being. For good reasons, uh, the EU proclaimed 2022 the European Year of Youth. Uh, we'll see the impact of the main initiatives, uh, if, if any. And then let's go back to women. Well, we, women have been, have been also among the main losers of the pandemic, partly because of caring responsibilities. And as I mentioned before, the sectors of accommodation and food services were hard uh, struck by the crisis where women are overrepresented. And the situation was even worse in domestic services where employment fell dramatically in 2020, while uh, uh, nearly nine in 10 workers in, in this uh, sector are women. Nevertheless, um, it should be stressed that the situation would have been much worse uh, if there had not been unprecedented economic and social support provided by the member states and the EU. We all know that there have been large scale measures such as job retention schemes, largely financed by the EU sure mechanism as well. And they were introduced in all member states to different extent. And so these measures uh, prevented mass layoffs and kept poverty risk in check. And here, one of the main findings of the book is that both market and disposable, disposable income inequality changed only slightly. 
at the end of the day, the pandemic seems just to have slowed down a previous decline in inequality, which started in 2017. And we all know that also the, pand the pandemic at the same time highlighted important loopholes in our social security systems. And here I'd like to also underline that under the RRF, each social measure that includes a focus notably on children and young people and on gender equality must be flagged by the member states. And this will allow for specific reporting on expenditure focused on these three dimensions. And one here, one can only hope that uh, this will somehow remedy um, the lack of quantified social targets in the IRF, contrary to the digital and the green targets. Well, let's see. Um, if we now look at the losers at the EU level, Amy Verdun and Bart highlight in their chapter, they show that the social affairs ministers and their advisory committees, and also uh, DG uh, employment and social affairs lost much of the ground they had gained already uh, over the past decade in the European semester. Similarly, um, we have representatives here, uh, trade unions and business representatives have been hurt by the institutions, but apparently they have not been listened to over the past uh, year. And uh, it seems that the situation is even worse with uh, regards to civil society organizations. Uh, they have been completely sidelined in regard to the EU uh, recovery. And all this, uh, Bart and Amy uh, show that is quite shocking, given that the RRF forces the member states to report on how they <coughs> consulted with the stakeholders. Unfortunately, this reporting has apparently not had any practical effects yet. Let's see. So up until now, I've been depicting quite a gloomy picture, uh, but that's the reality. But um, there have been also some winners. Uh, at national and at EU level from the pandemic. At the national level, due to the increased acceleration of digitalization, the winners included online retail and communication software, sector, software sectors. Moreover, due to the health uh, nature of the crisis, there uh, was increased demand in some branches of the health and care sectors. And another significant winner I think we are all aware of is the housing sector, especially uh, for investors. We all know that housing prices have been skyrocketing in the EU, and this development is expected to lead to increased rental market inequalities as income is being redistributed uh, from relatively poor tenants to relatively richer owners, which will be the winners of, of, um, of the pandemic. And among the winners, we could also say that the Southern and uh, Eastern European countries uh, will benefit quite a lot from the recovery funds. Well, if they can absorb the plant uh, massive increase in public investment. And at the EU level among the winners, we see that the SecGen and the JECFIN further strengthened their role uh, by steering the RRF. So to wrap up these conclusions, um, we would like to underline the main initiatives that took place in 2021 very briefly and plug a few that are being discussed as we speak. Uh, notably, I'd like to uh, highlight three main in initiatives. Uh, the first one, unsurprisingly, is the action pl plan of the European Pillar of Social Rights, which was endorsed in 2021 uh, by the EU institutions, the European social partners, and importantly, the European civil society representatives. So there is some hope for their involvement. Secondly, arguably the most ambitious EU social policy initiative since the start of the pandemic is the proposed directive on adequate minimum wages. And thirdly, uh, we have now on the EU agenda the proposed directive on platform work with a major purpose to improve the working conditions of platform workers uh, by ensuring um, that their employment status is correctly identified. The Commission's proposal is quite ambitious, but as already uh, Aida, you mentioned, 
let's see what the final agreement uh, would look like. And I can already reveal that the next Bilan will have a chapter on the political debates around this proposal. And so this was from me. Um, now I leave the floor to Bart, since he likes to have the final word. Thank you, Selena. Yes, I do like to have a final word, but it will be a very brief one because we are uh, uh, a little bit over time, uh, which is which is not good. So really, two minutes. Uh, maybe just just end on a little bit of a more positive note uh, than than your intervention, because of course, as we also described in the the conclusions of this book, uh, we see what we see is that after a disrupted EU social. Uh, policy making agenda in 2020, there is indeed a re-emergence uh, of that uh, agenda um, uh, in 2021 and also now in 2022. You already gave some important examples. Uh, and so I think that uh, when you look at the Commission's work program for 2022 and also uh, the ambitions of the French presidency, um, I think there is quite a lot of beef on the table, which is, um, which is a good thing, of course. At the same time, uh, the agenda is there leaves us with some questions we don't know um for example is there a scope now to finally agree on an instrument that would somehow counterbalance the social uh, sorry the macroeconomic imbalances procedure uh, the famous mip there are now talks of a social imbalances uh, procedure and i think i can make some publicity nicola we've just eti has just uh, uh, published a, a working paper written uh, uh, authored by uh, sebastiano uh, Sabata from the OSE, which, um, uh, which hopefully will feed into the ongoing discussions about the social imbalances procedure. What about the future European unemployment benefit scheme? You refer to sure, will that be used as a build up? What about uh, the EU uh, uh, a Green Deal and its ambitions? What about this famous conference on the future of Europe? We haven't talked about it uh, here today, we didn't have time for that. Will it lead to increased competences in health, as you suggested, or maybe uh, it will only produce some uh, declarations. Uh, many issues on the agenda, um, which uh, are, are questions to be addressed in the next book on social policy in the EU. I leave it there for you, Nicola. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Zlavina. Um, we could conclude this by saying we had a very good run, but it's now time to wrap it up. Uh, and my fear is that this could be also the conclusion that uh, 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 DG employment uh, could could reach unless uh, we come up with uh, new ideas, new demands, new requests. But they're always uh, uh, in the pipeline, as you can see. We've already received a couple of spoilers about the next issue of this uh, uh, wonderful classic now publication and uh, a new uh, uh, fruit of the collaboration between the ETUI and uh, our also colleagues. Uh, I'm very grateful uh, to them for uh, their work, uh, for uh, their efforts, uh, for their continuing support. Uh, I'm very grateful to our uh, speakers, uh, both here in the room and of course uh, online. This was a, a terrific event and I hope to see you all very, very soon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you all. It was really great. I mean, we did so Good much in yeah. excellent sharing. Two hours. Yeah. We managed to. Uh,